please. Please find me. Please, please come see me. Please help me. Someone. Anyone. It was the late 1980s, in a tourist coffee shop in Bangkok, Thailand, where an American backpacker named Adam noticed all the signs taped up on the walls of the coffee shop. The signs were desperate, like the search for a lost dog. Help me. See me. Someone. Anyone. But these signs weren't about lost, beloved animals. The signs were about forgotten people. Young women, who were once tourists, just like Adam. Tourists who found themselves, or in some cases put themselves, in a Thai women's prison. Busted on a drug charge. Many sentenced to decades in prison, sometimes life in prison, sometimes even death. These women from Australia, from England, Europe, America, were so far away from home, they didn't have family to visit. So these signs, created by their supporters, were requests for other Western tourists to come see them, to bring them essentials like food, cigarettes, a bit of company, a shred of hope. This was the thing back then, maybe it still is now, of visiting someone in Thailand in prison as part of your vacation. It was framed as the next step in tourism, even advertised on TripAdvisor, that when you were sick of the temples, the bars, markets, catch an express boat to a Bangkok prison. Adam, the American tourist, decided to pay some of these incarcerated Western women a visit. He wanted to hear their stories. And what he heard stuck with him. So much so that roughly a decade later, in the late 1990s, when Adam was now a Hollywood movie producer, he produced a film about the experiences he collected. A splashy Hollywood action movie slash prison movie slash based on a true story, true crime drama. Packaged as a chick flick, as we used to know them back then. It was called Broke Down Palace. And if you remember it, you might recall it starred Claire Danes and Kate Beckinsale, both relative newcomers to big Hollywood movies at that time. The movie credits were clear. These characters were fictitious, but they were based on Adam Field, the producer's recollection. So it might be more accurate to say these girls were inspired by or based on real people and real events. Composite characters drawn from those women producer Adam said he met all those years ago. When the movie came out in 1999, it was a box office flop. It reportedly cost 25 million to make and grossed only 10 million at the box office. On Rotten Tomatoes, this movie gets a squishy 31%, which seems pretty harsh. But I suppose the only people more condemning than judges in Thailand about illegal drug use are the self-appointed online movie critics. Broke Down Palace was criticized back then for not having enough tension. And what it lacked in tension, it tried to make up for with music by Sarah McLachlan, and truly the worst cover of Rock the Casbah I've ever heard. But 25 years later, I think it deserves a revisit. This movie captured the haplessness of two naive American girls as they confront the rigor of drug penalties at that time and the harrowing tedium of prison. And ultimately, the complexities of female friendships the type of power shifts and mind games that are harder to bring to the screen than two guys taking things out with their fists. It's about friendship and the sacrifices you make for the people you love. So how did two young American women end up as drug traffickers in Thailand? And will Brooke Down Palace make a good bedtime story? Let's find out. In this tropical nightmare of a dead sleep episode, drawn from Broke Down Palace. I'm Nancy Miller, the host of Dead Sleep True Crime for Bedtime. And thank you for an opportunity to experiment 
in this episode. I also have a special surprise for listeners at the end. So if you're still awake at the end, you won't want to miss it. So with that, let's settle in for the night. Get cozy under those covers and get ready to fall dead asleep with dead sleep. In my version of Broke Down Palace, starring Claire Danes, Kate Beckinsale, and Bill Pullman. Our story begins just about where every teen movie did back in the 1990s. A party in the woods in a town somewhere in America. There was beer and a bonfire, cute boys, and a lot of chatter between two best friends, Alice and Darlene. Alice and Darlene were best friends. They had been since they were kids. So of course, when they graduated from high school, they were going to celebrate their first real step into freedom with an unforgettable trip together. A send-off for Darlene, played by young brunette Kate Beckinsale, before Darlene headed off to college. And for best friend Alice, played by baby Claire Danes, this was her last hurrah before real life began. Job, adulthood, what it all meant, she didn't yet know. By the way, Claire Danes herself took this movie as a graduation gift. She deferred going to Yale for a year to take on this project, which she might have regretted later. But we'll get to that real-life drama later in the episode. Anyway, the two girls swig beer. Darlene, not too much because she was the good girl. And Alice, chugging like a sailor because she was the bad one. And they talked excitedly about this big trip to Hawaii. Who wouldn't want to go to Hawaii? I mean, take a deep breath and think about it. The paradise of the Pacific. Mainland Americans had been enjoying Hawaii as a vacation spot since Mark Twain. In an 1890s almanac, Hawaii is described as mild, equitable, delightful. Any degree of temperature from the semi-tropical to the everlasting snows may be experienced. The sea-scented breezes are health-giving and refreshing. Ozone abounds. Bathing in the Emerald Sea is a luxury. The lights and shadows fill the soul of an artist with unspeakable longings. Who wouldn't want that as a graduating senior for 11 whole days? Oh, you know who? Bad girl Alice. Alice, who was the alpha of the two girls, deemed Hawaii too basic. She told Darlene that Hawaii was like a middle-class vacation where your parents would go. It wasn't cool. You know where it was cool? Thailand. Thailand meant freedom. What could be better than a country named after the very thing they were looking for? And as if it were a message from the universe, a beer bottle falls to the ground at this graduation party. And when Alice looks down at the beer bottle, she discovers The beer is from Thailand. They had to go. So Alice and Darlene forged a plan. A classic teenage scheme we've all tried. And maybe you got away with it once, but never twice. And never on this scale. They planned to tell their fathers, who were footing the bill for their vacation, that they were going to Hawaii, but they'd secretly go to Thailand. And somehow, again, in a scheme that only two teenage girls could pull off before 9-11 and pre-smartphones, is that they somehow managed to switch their tickets and hotels and redirected their entire post-graduation adventure from Hawaii to Thailand. Right away, Darlene, that's Kate Beckinsale, 
and Alice, that's Claire Danes, discovered Bangkok, Thailand was not some touristy, prepaid luxury resort. Right away, they are jarred by their less-than-luxury hotel surroundings, which includes a giant cockroach that scuttles across the floor near their bed. Darlene screams. Darlene, at the time, had no idea just how intimately familiar she would become with cockroaches. But at this time, they were excited to be in Bangkok and set off to explore. Now, back in America, Alice was clear that she didn't want to go to a tourist trap like Hawaii. And yet, she convinced Darlene to sneak into a high-end resort, cordoned off from the rest of the world, insulated from the real Bangkok, so the girls could enjoy a dip in the pool. When they get to the hotel, Alice tells Darlene to walk in like you own the place. Alice, being the bad one, persuaded a waiter into believing they were guests at the hotel, only to be found out by the waiter after they'd racked up a huge hotel bill. The incensed waiter threatened to call the police. To the rescue was an Australian guy named Nick Parks, who stepped up and paid for the girls. Using a hotel room key he stole from the bathroom, the girls would discover. But he was their hero, or so it seemed. The girls, especially Darlene, were taken by Nick, the charming older Aussie with the twinkle in his eye. Now, back in America, the social hierarchy between the two girls was clear. Alice was the extroverted and fun blonde, the one that guys went for. And Darlene was the reserved and cautious brunette, the one guys overlooked. But now, here in Thailand, it flipped. It was Darlene, not Alice, who drew Nick's interest. But was it because she was more beautiful or more gullible? Whatever the case, one night, Nick took the girls out to a fancy party. And when it becomes clear of his interest in Darlene, Alice is upset. Alice is even more upset when Darlene doesn't come back to the hotel that night. When Alice woke up in the morning, Darlene wasn't there. She worried at first until Darlene rolled in all disheveled from a lively night with this new man. And excitedly, she tells Alice that Nick wants to take them to Hong Kong for the weekend. Hong Kong? It's about three and a half hours away by plane. Nick would take care of all the details. They just needed to pack their things and go. And Alice wasn't into it. There was more to explore here in Thailand. And she told Darlene she can go. But Alice was going to stay. Later, at an outdoor market, Alice ran into the charming Nick. Nick appeared to be flirting with her a little, and, well, Alice liked the attention. In the end, Nick somehow persuaded Alice to change her mind. In the movie, it's unclear. Had she slept with Nick? Because she could? As a means of hurting Darlene? What is clear is the outcome. The girls packed their bags and headed to the airport for a trip to Hong Kong for a few days with the handsome, cool Nick. This is where their trip turned from 11 days of fun into a drug trafficking version of Gilligan's Island. It was supposed to be a three hour flight that would turn into a 30 year nightmare. At the airport, waiting in line to board, the girls notice a commotion they spot police cars, lots of them, screeching up to the tarmac. Whatever that was about, somebody was in big trouble. The police rushed into the airport, and before Darlene and Alice even knew what was happening, they were pulled from the line, moments before boarding the plane. The girls are hustled out of the airport and taken into custody. This is serious. The police received a tip. 
two American girls smuggling drugs from Thailand to Hong Kong. The girls were separated and put in their individual cells. Alice, the savvier one of the two, demanded a lawyer. She wasn't going to say anything or sign anything until she spoke with a lawyer. Darlene sang like a canary. And she signed a statement in Thai that she believed was declaring her innocence. Instead, of course, it's a confession written by Thai authorities admitting her guilt. The girls try to explain to authorities that it wasn't them. It was some guy they met, this guy Nick Parks. They could clear everything up. They just need to find Nick Parks. When authorities try to find Nick Parks, no such man exists. The police say that the girls have invented this Nick Parks, and they will still have to stand trial for drug smuggling. Is at this point in the movie you think, they're not going to go to prison. They're two American girls. Someone from the U.S. Embassy will come and bail them out. But that's not what happens. Now remember, the girls' parents had no idea that the girls weren't in Hawaii. So making things even more complicated are that the two girls are in this place. And no one knows they're there. No one's coming to save them. They arrive at the prison, a run-down, sprawling, two-story cement compound where they might spend the rest of their lives. And they decide to grin and bear it. If they just hold tight until their trial, they'll make it. But as Alice later recalls, in a cassette tape she records and sends to a lawyer. She didn't know the system was rigged. In their cells in the Broke Down Palace, they encounter other women busted for smuggling drugs. And they begin to understand their case is far from unique. That someone set them up somehow and left them holding the backpack. They pray. Somebody finds Nick Parks. Finally, Darlene's father shows up at the prison. And the way the visitor section is set up in this Thai prison isn't like an American jail in the movies with the plexiglass and the phones. They have to scream at each other through fences across a bridge, essentially. And Darlene's father seems optimistic. He's going to get his daughter out of prison. But Alice... He's not so optimistic with Alice. He yells at Alice, saying that since she was six years old, she always lied. And clearly, she was lying again. And this is where Alice swears, this one time, she didn't do it, and then slams her hand on the wire fence to emphasize her innocence. Best scene in the movie, by the way. But you can't help but wonder. Is she telling the truth? It was Alice's backpack the drugs were found in. But Darlene was the one who packed the bag. Maybe it wasn't Alice. Maybe it was Darlene this one time, seduced by Nick's promises and unwilling to admit it. When their case goes to court, the girls are hopeful and entitled. They believe they were telling the truth. And, as Americans, they'd be found innocent and sent home. The lawyers make the case, and then the judge announces his verdict. The judge says it all in Thai, so the girls don't understand a word. What's the verdict? Are they free to go? Their lawyers tell the girls it's good news. They didn't get the death penalty. They didn't get life imprisonment. But what they did get was 33 years in a Thai prison each. Which meant if they fulfilled their entire sentence, the 18-year-old girls in 1999 would be released in 2032 at the middle age of 51. The girls were convicted. 
they were sentenced. And they only had one hope at this point, an appeal. And to get that appeal, Alice sends a recording on this cassette tape that I'm honestly not sure how she records in a Thai prison that doesn't have beds or fresh water, but somehow the message gets through to an American lawyer named Yankee Hank, played by Bill Pullman in his charming, mumbling way, along with his Thai wife and fellow attorney, played by Jacqueline Kim. He deems the case and the money worth his time. And Yankee Hank decides to reinvestigate the case the way the police wouldn't. And step one in his investigation, track down Nick Parks. And as he retraces the steps of Nick and the girls, he uncovers it's Alice, not Darlene, who was spotted with Nick at his hotel just before that trip to Hong Kong. When he meets with Alice, she swears that Nick came on to her, but she told him to forget it. She also swears that he never mentioned anything about drugs, especially not six kilos, that's 13 pounds of heroin, to smuggle in a backpack. Was this another of Alice's lies? Eventually, the girls secure another court date. And Yankee Hank, that's Bill Pullman, busts out some impressive-sounding tie as he makes a case for the girls. How six kilos of heroin could never fit in any backpack, how the drugs were planted, how none of it added up. And at first it looks good. Alice and Darlene might get an appeal, which could lead to their sentence being vacated, and they get to go home. That is, until a familiar face walks into the courtroom. It takes a beat for Alice to remember who it was. It's the waiter from that hotel. The one where they'd snuck in and ordered a bunch of food and drinks without paying the day they met Nick Parks. And that waiter remembers the girls. And he testifies that they tried to pull a fast one. That they were scheming thieves. And their behavior at the hotel suggested a low character. If they lied about these hotel drinks, weren't they capable of lying about smuggling drugs too? Their 33-year sentence would stand. As the girls are dragged away screaming and yelling, Yankee Hank tells Alice and Darlene that Thailand is their home now, and they better get used to it. Alice and Darlene are still in shock as they try to adjust to prison life in their broke-down palace. And this is where the girls begin to diverge. Darlene is busy writing letters to the President of the United States asking for help. Meanwhile, Alice gets high. She's smoking something in the prison yard with a DIY roach clip. She tells Darlene if she doesn't numb herself with drugs, she might kill someone. Needless to say, tensions are running high between the two girls. Alice tries to relax her mind by watching a fellow inmate move sand around, slowly, meticulously, in a giant zen sand garden. By day, the girls work in the heat just to get some food. By night, they sleep curled up on the floor. While Alice and Darlene struggle with prison life, Hank discovers that this Nick, he's a low-level hustler. And this whole drug planting thing was part of his scheme. This guy Nick had done it a million times, that Nick looks for suckers. Girls he can seduce, get them to trust him, and then he starts to ask for things make promises, like trips to Paris and vacations in Switzerland. The girls get so used to saying yes, they forget how to say no. This time, when Hank visits the prison, he accuses Darlene, not Alice, of smuggling. Nick wined and dined you, made love to you, and convinced you to become a drug meal. But Darlene swears he didn't ask her. And in this conversation, Darlene realizes it must have been Alice who agreed to the smuggling scheme. She runs into the prison yard and yells, I wasn't groovy enough. But you sure were. 
Darlene accuses Alice of sleeping with Nick. Alice swears she didn't, that she's telling the truth. Nothing happened. Darlene and Alice turn on each other. Darlene tells Alice she ruined her whole life. Alice keeps getting high. Darlene keeps writing to various political officials in the United States. But Darlene, overall, isn't doing well. And one day, in the middle of the prison yard, she collapses to the ground. When Darlene goes to the doctor, they discover a cockroach had crawled into her ear canal, creating an infection. Darlene's illness reunites the girls. Then the what-ifs begin. And the what-ifs are all on Alice. What if they'd gone to Hawaii like they'd planned? What if Alice and Darlene paid for those drinks at the pool instead of scheming to get them for free? What if Alice had told Darlene that Nick had hit on her? They wouldn't have gone to Hong Kong. They wouldn't be in Thailand. They'd be safe in Hawaii, and none of this would have happened. Alice, feeling responsible for this whole thing, starts to plan a prison escape. She bribes a guard who promises to leave a door unlocked. Unfortunately, the girls are caught trying to escape and quickly thrown into solitary confinement. What's more, they've just added 15 years to their 33-year sentences for trying to escape. That's essentially life in prison. Through Hank's investigation, the girls learn that it was Nick who tipped off the police. The girls were just arrested as insurance. They were basically decoys. They were never expected to get on that plane to Hong Kong. They were pegged to be arrested from the very start. And Nick was long gone. Now we understand Alice is telling the truth, that she and Darlene are both innocent. But to go free, they'll have to admit guilt. Because the way it works in these Thai courts, they soon learn, is that if they confess and say they're guilty and admit that Nick was a figment of their imagination, they'd help the government save face and the Crown would pardon them and they'd go free. But when they appear in that courtroom that day, things don't go as planned. The girl's confession is rejected, and they're sent back to prison for good. But as the girls are dragged away, Alice busts out the tie, and she declares Darlene's innocence. And Alice, who had always been lying and scheming, takes the blame on herself. This time she tells a lie with valor. That she did do it because she was foolish and jealous and she was afraid that her best friend was going to drift away. She didn't need her friend Darlene to go to prison for her mistakes. Alice begs the judge, I'll do her time and my time. Just let her go, please. Alice breaks down, but she agrees to serve her time and Darlene's time, that's 66 years, plus the combined 30 years for trying to escape for a total of 96 years behind bars in Thailand. Darlene will go free and Alice will stay in prison. At the end of the movie, Alice is behind bars, and Darlene is in street clothes, getting into a car, heading back to the States. In the last few moments, Alice reiterates what she did, that this was the right thing to do. And she knows that Darlene will never stop trying, until she's out of prison, until she's free. After rewatching this movie, I wondered, what would it really take to survive in a Thai prison? 
And when was the last big case of a foreigner busted for drug smuggling and sent to do hard time in a real-life broke-down palace? I wasn't sure if I was going to find someone, but I did. And more about her in a moment. Because it's worth mentioning what happened to Claire Danes in real life after this movie. Now, we know the movie was a box office flop, but Claire Danes was praised for her performance, so it didn't hurt her career. What did hurt her was while she was doing press for the movie. The film took place in Thailand, but was shot in the Philippines. The broke down palace in real life was a mental health facility for women vagrants, as they called it. And during interviews, Claire Danes couldn't stop talking about how awful she found the Philippines. She said it smelled like cockroaches, among other insults. At first, a prominent politician in the Philippines was forgiving, basically saying Claire Danes was a perfectly nice girl, it's okay. But when Claire Danes wouldn't stop talking badly about the Philippines, the country decided it had enough. And in 2000, they banned Claire Danes movies. Any movie with Claire Danes in it from playing in the Philippines. And it's a ban that reportedly still stands today. Which doesn't sound like a big deal. Except the Philippines has a population of over 100 million people, with some of the highest level of theater admissions in Southeast Asia. When Broke Down Palace was released, they probably could have used a few million of those tickets in the Philippines. So as I said, I watched this movie and was curious about foreign women who'd done hard time in Thailand in the last 20 years. And it just so happened that an Australian woman named Holly Dean Johns just published, earlier in February of 2024, a memoir. It's titled Holly's Hell, Seven Years in a Thai Prison. I read it and was thunderstruck by her story. How in real life, right around the time Broke Down Palace came out, 29-year-old Holly was charged with heroin trafficking and ended up in the infamous Thai prison known as the Bangkok Hilton. So I called her up to see if she'd be interested in speaking with me for a special episode of the show. She said yes. So I'll be dropping a full episode of my interview with Holly, the real story of the real Broke Down Palace. Holly's memoir is a raw story about endurance, redemption, friendship, compassion, and what to do when you are bitten by a millipede the size of a grown man's forearm. It's a lively interview you don't want to miss. And I look forward to sharing the episode with you. So be sure to follow the show so you don't miss it. Until then, thanks for listening to Dead Sleep True Crime for Bedtime. Nighty-night.